The Tom Woods Show, episode 670. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here talking about philanthropy today. Took us till episode 670 for some reason to talk about this important ingredient of a free society. And joining us to talk about it is Carl Zinsmeister, who is vice president of publications over at the Philanthropy Roundtable. You can check them out at philanthropyroundtable.org. He's also just released The Almanac of American Philanthropy, a huge book and a beautiful book, very much worth checking out. He, for many years, held a chair at the American Enterprise Institute, where he served as editor-in-chief of its magazine, The American Enterprise. From 2006 to 2009, he also served in the West Wing as the president's chief domestic policy advisor. Carl, welcome to the show. Happy to be with you. Tell me about the Philanthropy Roundtable before we get started. Well, we're an association based in Washington, D.C. that uh, helps donors of all types um, basically become more effective and more efficient in what they do. So we try not to prescribe what they should do, but we we try to just make them uh, do it well because private giving is just a really important uh, part of our nation and solver of, of public problems. I wonder about the trends in private giving. Now, how long have you been with the Philanthropy Roundtable? I've been here, what, four or five years, something like that. And it's gone up, um, you know, every year. That's kind of been the pattern through American history. But there's a very interesting kind of constant, which is that private giving has, with little ups and downs here and there, basically averaged about 2% of GDP for forever. And that's a big number, Tom, just to remind our listeners, 2% of GDP this year is roughly $360 billion. That's how much cash got given away last year. And um, in addition to that, of course, you have to consider the value of uh, volunteer labor, you know, the, the hours that people put into uh, to nonprofit and charitable projects. If you put some sort of reasonable dollar figure on the per hour um, you know, contributions, that would be close to that much more money. So we're talking about you know, $700 billion, something like that, effectively, of, of uh, in-kind and cash support that's, that's, uh, that Americans are putting up voluntarily. Pretty extraordinary number, really. Yeah, and I ask you not so much because I want to, you know, say USA, USA, but just out of general curiosity, I know I've heard it said, certainly by politicians, uh, that I'm not sure I can trust, that America is a very generous country and so on and so forth. But do you know any numbers that we can use to compare American giving with giving in other countries? Yeah, um, it's really just startling. There aren't very many things where any country kind of is an outlier all by itself. But 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 private giving, you know, voluntary giving is one where the U.S. just does not have a counterpart. Tom, um, our giving is about um, 40% more on a fair basis, on a per capita, you know, adjusted for inflation, adjusted for the sizes of their economies and so forth. If you if you compare in that fair way, our our giving is about 40 percent higher per person than the Canadians, which would be our closest, wow. our, our closest competitor. And then it just falls off a, a cliff. From there, you go down to, it's, it's, the giving in Germany, for instance, is one-tenth of our level. Uh, Japan, France, you know, one-fifteenth, one-twentieth of our level. So there, there really is no other country today that has this powerful tradition of solving problems through, uh, through, through voluntary giving. Yeah. All right. So there now we start to get to the heart of what may be the explanation. I mean, when you, as you say, when you have an outlier like this, it it's very unusual and it really demands explanation. Is it a cultural difference? Is it a is it a matter of? I mean, obviously, these are a lot of these are places with big welfare states, and that may encourage the idea that I don't need to do any giving because the government's already taken care of everything. It, it, that's that's certainly um, part of it. Um, I, if I had to sort of boil it down to the, the most important consequences, uh, I, I, I would say three things, Tom. I'd say, first of all, the religion is absolutely definitely a part of this. As, as, as you and I'm sure most of our listeners know, the United States is very unusual for an industrial country of its sort to, to, to have extremely high levels of religious practice at the same time. And that's, that's a big part of philanthropy. We know that uh, religious causes are the number one place that people give their money. It's more than a third of all those donations, I said, go to religious topics. Now, and, and it isn't specifically, you know, just building up churches. It's, you know, when you help 
people in Africa. That is often done through a religious organization. A lot of homeless uh, uh, projects are, are religiously based. Uh, you know, a lot of education, uh, educational alternatives are, are religious schools. So religion covers a lot of waterfront, but that is a huge part of what makes people give in this country. And, uh, and our religious heritage is, is important there. The second place I would identify that's really distinctive is our entrepreneurial tradition. For whatever reason, um, big private giving, serious methodical private giving is really closely linked to entrepreneurship. It's not closely linked to corporate, you know, business, but it is very closely linked to the, the kind of self-made guys who go out there, form companies, and often later in life end up being very, very generous donors. And the third piece is this kind of cultural element. You mentioned culture. Um, you know, we, we were a frontier nation where very often the societies were up and running before there was a state, before there was any official government. Now, that doesn't mean that they, they didn't govern themselves, but they governed themselves informally through civil society, through associations and groups and neighborly uh, you know, gatherings. And that tradition of we got a problem, we'll solve it as, 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 as citizens rather than as, you know, uh, subjects of government stuck. You know, when, when there were storms and barns blew down, people rebuilt them together without a state edict or a state intervention of any sort. And that became a habit, became a trope. It's very distinctive in our past, and it's something that continues today. Isn't that one of the complaints about a philanthropic enterprise that government could carry out a lot of these functions a lot more efficiently if we had experts in charge? And if you just have people just doing uh, haphazard giving, there's no way that can have the, the same level of efficiency. Actually, that, that is an argument you, you hear, Tom. You're correct. And it is just completely spurious. The, the book I've just finished on this topic, which is called The Almanac of American Philanthropy, uh, takes that on frontally. And we, I talk about that. And the reality is that philanthropy is actually much more efficient than government. And even perhaps more importantly, it's much, um, much more inventive. It's, it's, it's obviously more varied. And when you have a, a lots and lots of different attempts to solve problems, you, you, will, you will pick up different pieces of, 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 of the dilemma in different ways. And, um, you know, human beings are not robots. They vary tremendously. Our regions still vary tremendously. Um, the nature of our, of our dilemmas vary. And when you have multiple takes on solutions, uh, the history is that that is simply going to be much more effective because, you know, the way you – the way you fix an education problem is not the same in northern Manhattan as it is in, in, in Manhattan, Kansas. And um, so you've, you've got to have variations and, and, and the kind of the variety, what people will sometimes call a crazy quilt of, you know, of different solutions through philanthropy and sometimes say that dismissively, actually is a strength in the long run, I think, of the entire industry. Who's doing the giving? Is it a small number of big givers, or is it a large number of small givers, or what is it? That's a really fascinating question. The, um, the, the amazing thing is that the, uh, most of the giving is actually everyday Americans. Uh, let me just give you the figures on that. For the latest year, last year, um, only 14% of all of our giving came from foundations. So, you know, we hear about the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, so when we think, oh, that's philanthropy. Actually, that's a very small part of American philanthropy. All together, every single one of those foundations totaled up, came to only 14% of the, of the cash we donated voluntarily. And corporations only gave another 5%. So where did the other 81% come from? From individuals. Now, some of that came from wealthy individuals writing checks, but the vast portion of it came from everyday American families who give today at the rate of about 2,500 bucks a year per household. And you multiply that by, you know, a hundred and some million households and you get big money. So this is a very democratic phenomenon, very, very broad base. And um, that's uh, a big part of its power. All right. So now let's talk about what are people giving to? You mentioned uh, religious outlets. And, and as you say, that can encompass a wide array of, of different projects. It's not just, the, as you say, the building of churches, but churches are involved in a lot of activities. But other than that, I mean, are we talking, uh, is, it, is it for helping the poor? Is it historical preservation? How does it all break down? All of the above. Um, it's really fascinating. The, uh, the number two area, I believe, just kind of remembering here, is, is medical philanthropy of various sorts. And, uh, and then there's kind of children and families, and education is big up there, the anti-poverty work you just mentioned. Um, but there's also things like nature, uh, animals, um, you know, veterans, overseas giving. There's just a huge range of things that Americans are interested in. And the thing that really startled me, Tom, when I got into my research 
for this huge book. Um, this book is you know a thirteen hundred page book. It's really an exhaustive um, look at, at at this whole phenomenon of private giving. And when I went into it, I had no idea how many things have been approached by private donors and how many things have been solved by private donors. And it goes into areas you would never guess. For instance, I was just amazed to learn that the 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 guy who really won World War II for us was a a private donor who made it his personal project to develop uh, the radar systems that went into thousands of planes and ships during the war. There were, of course, government programs to develop radar, and they were just horribly bogged down in red tape and bureaucracy and, and, and ineffectiveness. And a gentleman named Alfred Loomis, who was one of the wealthiest men in the country and a, and a very, very talented scientist himself on the side, recognized this. And he went into action. He set up his own lab, mastered the basics of of radar, and then led the national effort to produce these and make them practical devices uh, in, that actually helped us win World War II. Uh, he did much the same thing then with the Manhattan Project. Many of the scientists he recruited for his radar project were moved directly into the Manhattan Project, and most of his method, this very kind of entrepreneurial, unconventional method that he set up, uh, was also transferred over to the Manhattan Project. He personally uh, was a great friend of Ernest Lawrence and built the cyclotron where most of the uh, uranium was purified for the bombs that were used over Japan. So again, one individual donor in this case was hugely important in winning a war effort, which is something we all think of as perhaps the ultimate government responsibility, not a place that, that philanthropists could, could be of any use. Well, they were, they have been, and there are lots of other fields like that. I'm looking at the uh, Amazon page for, for the book. I didn't realize that, as you say, it's about 1,300 pages, and yet it, the hardcover, it's, it's a hardcover book for only $25. Yeah. That's probably, I mean, this looks like a book that must have been released 100 years ago at that price. That's, that's <laughs> unbelievable. I, I'm, and in the description, of course, the description of the book includes some of the things that we've talked about, the amount of money donated every year and the, the U.S. ratio as compared to others. Uh, but then let me just read from this. Uh, Until now, there's been no definitive book on America's distinctive philanthropy. This authoritative, highly readable new reference fills that hole. In a single volume, it chronicles the greatest achievements of American private giving, profiles the most influential donors, collects the essential statistics, and summarizes the best ideas on charitable assistance that have been written or spoken. Uh, so a tremendous, I mean, a tremendous book to own for a lot of reasons, but it is an area which, you know, ever since, um, I guess it was de Tocqueville said in the 1830s that one of the things that impressed him was that he came to the U.S. and whenever some project needed to be undertaken, people just got together and formed an association and did it. So it's been part of the American character for a good 200 years. Absolutely. And, and you know, people don't ask permission, even to this day. They just kind of act. I, I'm encouraging people. I'm giving a lot of talks about the book around the country, and I'm encouraging people to think of those millions of donors and those hundreds of thousands of, you know, local nonprofits as basically miniature legislatures. That's really what they are. They look around themselves and they say, hmm, you know, here in Des Moines, we have an issue with parks. We don't have enough parks. And, and you know, we need a children's hospital and we got a homeless problem. And then, they, again, they don't write their congressman and say, please fix this stuff, mother may I. They just jump in there and they apply their time and their energy and their resources to, to solve things. And that happens over and over and all across the country. And there's a, there's, there's a temptation to think, well, that's just a, a little drop in the bucket here and there. But if everybody's doing that, if people are doing that in Des Moines and every other state, and even within those cities, there's different groups and different factions, it becomes this mighty river of joined effort. It's your classic kind of spontaneous order that emerges when, when people take responsibility for their own lives. And you're right, it impressed Tocqueville and impressed a lot of early observers, and it's very much a part of, of, our, of, our, of our culture today. Um, the other thing that's interesting, Tom, is this, this book is so fun to read. It's re I mean, maybe it sounds like an encyclopedia to people, and there is that aspect. We really tried to make it the authority, kind of the Bible of, of private giving and philanthropy. But it's so much fun to read simply because these characters, uh, these characters are larger than life. There's just these amazing people in there who kind of just jumped into the fray and were not intimidated by the scale or scope of problems, decided they wanted to act. Not all of them are moguls. Again, I have lots and lots of stories of little people who kind of just chipped off a piece of, of, of the national puzzle and said, I'm going to work on this and did some astonishing things. Yeah. Give me an example of one of those people. 
Well, you know, there's, there's, there's some really great stuff. There's this wonderful story. Some of our listeners may have heard of a, a, a washerwoman in uh, southern Mississippi, literally just made her living, Tom, uh, boiling clothes uh, over a fire and then hanging them on, 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 on lines and drying them. And, you know, this, this is what she did for her whole life, was probably paid mostly in quarters and nickels and dollar bills, literally. And she, like a lot of uh, Americans, was a serious uh, uh, saver. She was very thrifty. And toward the end of her life, um, she kind of sat down with um, the, the bank president in her hometown. And she said, you know what? I have several hundred thousand dollars in the bank. And I've decided I need about $150,000 to live on now that my arthritis is too bad and I can't do laundry anymore. And the rest of it, I want to get to the local university to set up some scholarships. And people were just breathtaking that this, this, that this very humble woman who'd worked so hard all her life chose to do this with her proceeds. They were so moved that um, people in the entire region just kind of spontaneously decided they wanted to match her gift. So there was this big outpouring of supplementary donations to, to follow Osceola. Her name was Alice Osceola McCarty. And um, these were pooled together and sent to the university and have been funding a number of scholarships every single year since. So there's just beautiful stories like that. There's another guy uh, I became acquainted with who was a, sh- a shoe shiner in uh, Shine Shoes in Pittsburgh. And if, I don't know quite what reason it was, Tom, but when he was a, uh, at some point in the 1980s, he decided he was going to give all of his tips to the children's hospital there in Pittsburgh for their free care fund, which as the name implies is for families that can't afford to have their kids treated. And he did this methodically just for the rest of his career. He just recently retired and he, um, he ended up donating, I don't have the figure in front of me, but I think it was something like 250 or $300,000. So, you know, small gifts can, can really make differences uh, in, in people's lives, particularly if, as in our country, lots and lots of, uh, a big portion of the population are, uh, are making those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of gifts. In your speech in Hillsdale, you used a word people probably don't use that much. Most people go through their lives not using it. And I bet you know what I'm going to say, polyarchy. Hmm. Can you talk about that word and what it has to do with anything? Yeah, I'm trying to single-handedly revive it here, Tom, so thank you uh, for getting it out there. (laughs) Hey, it's my pleasure. I'm just here to help. (laughs) It's actually much easier to understand and to remember than you think. It's kind of the opposite of monarchy, all right? Everyone knows monarchy. You know, one guy has all the power and all the authority. Polyarchy is the opposite. It's when authority and power are widely distributed all across a society. And those of our listeners who have done much traveling will, will know that America is pretty unusual in this regard. If, if you're in France, the whole world centers around Paris. That's where the educational you know, center is. That's where banking takes place. That's where you know, industry is based. If, if, you, if you're a musician, you've got to be in Paris. Same thing isn't true in France. You know, Tokyo is the center. That's not the true in the U.S. The U.S. is a much more uh, widely decentralized uh, uh, culture where if you're, you know, the center of banking is Charlotte. And, you know, if you're in in, in the energy sector, you're going to be in Houston. And if, and if you're in entertainment, you might be in Nashville, or you might be in Los Angeles. Uh, and, you know, the technology folks are in Silicon Valley or, or perhaps Boston. If you're a rock and roll guitarist, you might be in Minneapolis. Um, so, the, you know, we have a very broad distribution of, of resources and authority and ideas and energy across our country. Very, very important part of making America, America. And philanthropy has a lot to do with that. Philanthropy, again, are these kind of millions of little legislatures that bring authority and power uh, to, uh, to remote places. And, and this often comes up as a practical issue. For instance, there's a, there's a guy who made a lot of money in, in um, the uh, investment business in uh, Kansas City and wanted to set up a big medical research facility. So all the professional advisors said, oh, of course, you should give it to you know, Sloan Kettering or you should give it to Johns Hopkins or one of the big dogs. And, and he said, actually, you know, I kind of want to keep the money here in Kansas City where I made it. And, and they said, oh, they were horrified. You know, oh, my gosh, Kansas City's not a center of biomedical research. You can't do that. And they said, you know, at the very least, um, you know, send it to, to one of the, the, the existing uh, big cities centers and set up your own, your own new institution there. And he said, no, I'm actually going to set up a new institution right here in Kansas City. Anyway, he ended up creating what's called the Stowers Institute, which has had a remarkable record since then and has, by the way, turned Kansas City into a biomed research center. And, and those kinds of decisions have been ha- taking place over and over in all kinds of places and have created a, a, a wonderfully uh, kind of broadly distributed prosperity uh, across this country. So polyarchy, this, again, this, this distribution of resources and philanthropy go hand in hand and are something that Americans can be very proud of. What is the relationship between philanthropy and tax policy? Is there one? 
There is, of course. Um, you know, our our uh, tax system is set up to um, to basically um, not tax you on money that you give to others. And the notion there is a, is a fundamentally sound one that you're not consuming your income if you give it to others. If you if you give it away, it's it's not properly considered income because it doesn't come to you. Um, it also, however, has really important practical ramifications. As we've discussed, for instance, more than a third of all charity goes to some, or at least through some religious institution. And the kind of non-intervention of the state in the form of keeping its hands off of any sort of um, uh, nonprofit or charitable activity is really important to uh, kind of separating those functions. So um, this tradition we've always had of making charitable don- donations tax-free and of making charities uh, not taxed either is, is really important to our liberty, really important to the effectiveness and, and the power of, of our philanthropic sector. Is there ever any possibility that there will be government policy that could undermine philanthropy that might put a cap on how much money would be deductible that you could give? Is there ever any talk about that? Oh, all the time. Uh, you know, the, uh, President Obama's tried, I'm trying to remember, I think about a half dozen times to do exactly what you just described. That's what I thought. I, d- I didn't know if I, yeah, if I was remembering that right. Okay, yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's very worrisome, actually. Um, you know, there have been these 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 spasms from time to time to try to to try to cap philanthropy, and and you know the, the arguments I always use is, oh, that's lost income to the government. You know, there's billions of dollars of money that we could be collecting in, at the government and doing public good with instead of letting it be directed by you know amateurs. Really, a deadly argument, a crazy argument, very undemocratic and 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 very uh, centralist in its kind of orientation. Um, but, um, you know, government is a very jealous master. Government does not like to have competing institutions and philanthropy is directly in competition with government in a lot of areas. I mean, philanthropy has, for instance, really set up the entire charter school business. I mean, once charter schools are operating, they, they get public funds, but you have to find and buy a building. You have to train school, school teachers. You have to write a curriculum. You have to create a whole infrastructure. All that is done with donated funds. And charter schools have been enormously successful and not only have helped millions of children directly, but have kind of put the lie to this notion that, oh, you know, some inner city kids are just bearing so many burdens from their background, they can't be educated. You know, that's the, that, that's the excuse you hear from a lot of uh, inner city uh, public school leaders. And it's bogus. And the charter schools have proven this. You literally have charter schools in Harlem right now that are getting better test scores than, than um, schools in suburban Westchester. It, it's just shocking and wonderful and startling. But it shows that if you have proper standards and r- r- devote yourselves to the task that even children bearing difficult social burdens can be educated. And this makes teachers unions look bad. It makes uh, public school administrators look bad. It makes politicians look bad. And some of them are jealous and frustrated and strike out e- either subliminally or, 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 you know, directly. And um, that's what, one of the reasons it's very, very important for Americans to kind of be, be, be zealous in guarding the independence and the liberty and the freedom and the choices that, uh, that we currently have to direct our money wherever we please, whatever we think needs doing, whatever we choose, and, and not uh, whatever some bureaucrat approves. Well, I'm looking right now at philanthropyroundtable.org, and it's got a whole – I mean, I, I'd love to just start reading some of these links because it's it's got all kinds of items of interest, and some of them are actual examples of – philanthropic activities that have had really, really good results. And this is especially important today because it's an election year, and every election year you get people who do believe in a free society, more or less, and they're all down in the dumps. They say, oh, the candidates are terrible, and no matter what happens, America's going down the tubes. There won't be any America again. And just this week I hit I hit episode number 666. So I thought, you know what? Darn it, on that episode, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to talk about good and favorable and optimistic things. And this is exactly it. Yeah. Philanthropyroundtable.org actually has real examples of good things happening. Well, thank you, um, Tom. But yeah, I mean, this is, I, I'm basically making exactly the same message you just did. That, However frozen our government is today, and Lord, Lord knows it's not inspiring most of us. However, how, however horrible that tundra looks to those of us who, 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 you know, who love liberty and who really want to have America thrive as it has in the past, you don't have to be, you don't have to shut down. You don't have to be discouraged by that, by that government lockup because there are other ways to solve problems. This is so important for people to understand and appreciate. 
I just finished an article that's going to be in the next issue of our magazine, Tom. We published a, a quarterly magazine called Philanthropy. And this story was just such a thrill for me to put together. I basically interviewed a bunch of uh, the directors of some of the greatest science labs around the country, most, mostly medical research labs, but not exclusively. And they told me philanthropy is unbelievably important. Now, as a fraction of the total flow of money they get, it's not nearly as – the private giving is not nearly as big as what comes from the NIH, the government, you know, National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation. Those are the big public sources, and they are incredibly bureaucratic. And, you know, they're important. I'm, I'm not against, you know, p- public funding of medical research, but the reality is that it is extremely stodgy, it is extremely slow moving, it is inflexible, and it has very uh, small effects on the net innovation of our country, the new drugs, the new treatments, the new exciting new things that save lives. A lot of that comes from private giving, simply because it has so few strings attached, because it is so much nimbler, so much able to be redirected. Just to give you a quick example, uh, I mean, uh, the, the average age of first grant for an NIH medical researcher is 45 years old today. And only 1% of all NIH money goes to a researcher who's 35 or younger. A lot of our listeners know that, you know, science is like the Olympics. You're over the hill when you're 35. I mean, most interesting, you know, paradigm breaking new discoveries come from young people who haven't yet been conditioned with the conventional wisdom and who have the sort of freshest knowledge as they come out of their training. And the fact that those people are finding it so hard to get public funding and a lot of them is kind of starving to death and leaving the profession or kind of giving up. They call it, there's not actually a term, they call it the, uh, the valley of death for these young researchers who can't get government funding because government funding is so stodgy and conservative and basically only willing to bet on horses that have already won. Well, if you're a you know, two-year-old uh, thoroughbred ready to roar but haven't yet run, 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 won a race and they won't let you get into the race until you've proven yourself, that's a terrible catch-22 circle. So philanthropy has been really important in science uh, of all sorts in, in sort of really helping true innovation and, and growth and, and fresh discovery take place. Well, the book is The Almanac of American Philanthropy, and the website we've been talking about is philanthropyroundtable.org. I'll link to both of them on the show notes page for today, which is tomwoods.com slash 670. That's 670. And uh, it's a beautiful book. I mean, you really should consider it, uh, getting it, and it could be a good gift in certain circumstances. So, uh, Carl, I appreciate your time. It's a topic we have not yet covered, oddly enough, in 670 episodes, but I would say philanthropy and liberty go very well together, and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Thanks so much. Likewise. Appreciate having me. All right, everybody, don't forget to check out the show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 670. I'll be linking you to the Philanthropy Roundtable and to the Almanac of, Ale- of American Philanthropy. You can learn more about what Carl is up to. It's very, very important work that he's doing. I do want to make mention of yet another website begun by a Tom Wood Show listener, and that is highqualitybibles.com. And it's fairly self-explanatory. When you check it out, it is a very beautiful site where you can, in fact, find beautiful Bibles and various other uh, resources that you would want to have at hand when reading and studying the Bible. So check that out at highqualitybibles.com. We'll be linking to that as the listener website mentioned at tomwoods.com slash 670. And if you would also like a shout out for your not yet created blog or website, then check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. Make sure you get your hosting through my link and I'll be glad to do this for you and link to you on my show notes page, as well as give you two dozen free video tutorials to help get you up and running with your new blog. Okay, I am going to tell, I want to tell you a couple quick uh, scheduling things. I'm going to be out of town this weekend speaking at the Libertarian Party National Convention, and just before that I just returned from Seattle, and there's just been a little bit of turmoil in my life with all this going on and not that much stability. So I'm actually going to take advantage of the long weekend, and we're not going to have a Tom Wood Show episode on Monday but I just need it as a mental health day with all the traveling I've been doing. And secondly, Contra Krugman will be slightly delayed as a result of this as well. Something's got to give here, people. On the one hand, we could produce Contra Krugman, but then if I lose my mind, then in the long run, you won't get as many episodes. So that's the way we're going to do it. Just just sit tight. In the meantime, if you haven't been listening to Contra Krugman, you can check that out at ContraKrugman.com. That'll give you a lot of things to listen to while you're waiting for Tuesday's episode of The Tom Wood Show. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.